Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure there's, well, there's possibly one thing that we agree on, and that is that the Conservatives have branded themselves and wrapped themselves in a cloak of crime and punishment. And as a result, they're blind to evidence, they are blind to the costs, they are blind to the fact that we have the lowest crime rate since 1973. They are blind to building safe and healthy communities. They are blind to the horrendous experience of the U.S. and its war on drugs regime that is now being slowly repealed, including uh, 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 the repeal of mandatory minimum sentencing, as my colleague from Winnipeg Centre just pointed out, because of its catastrophic failure on people and society overall. They are blind to the evidence here in Canada, and they are blind to the real impacts on what these bills will have on the lives of, of people and on communities overall. And added to that is that this particular government, these Conservative members, are blind to parliamentary democracy. They are only interested with this bill and other bills that we've seen, a steady stream of them, they are only interested in manipulating people, creating fear, division, and creating a them and us scenario. Mr. Speaker, I believe from the bottom of my heart that this omnibus bill is offensive because it is politically motivated and will have enormous negative impacts. Um, I was uh, very involved in some of these bills previously, particularly the drug crime bill, which I'll go into. But to me, listening to the debate today, it is astounding to see how the Conservative members are completely divorced from the reality of what's going on. They cannot recognize that we have uh, the lowest crime rate since 1973. They cannot uh, comprehend or deal with the fact that federal and provincial prisons are skyrocketing and, in fact, even double and even triple bunking, resulting in part from bills like the Truth in Sentencing Act, which was passed in the last uh, parliament. Uh, maybe, and I wish, we had uh, the Conservatives who had the courage to, have, to bring forward the Truth in Prison Costs Bill, then maybe we'd have a better balance and a better handle on what's really going on here. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that these nine bills have no relevancy together. They have been politically put together in one bill to ram them through this House in 100 days. And it, it defies the reality of, for example, uh, an annual report that just came out from the Public Prosecution Services of Canada for 2010-2011 that shows us that almost three-quarters, 72 percent of all cases handled by federal prosecutors last year involved drug cases, about 58,000 cases. Of those cases, only about 2 percent were complex meaning that the vast majority of those cases were actually straightforward in terms of the impacts of some of these bills and, and the, the kind of uh, uh, law enforcement approach that the Conservative government has taken. They've also hidden the real costs from Canadians during the election on the cost of this and all of the bills in the package. Um, but we do know that the real cost will be billions of dollars, both in terms of provincial costs in prisons, but also in terms of federal costs. Mr. Speaker, I've heard so many times that the Conservatives are trying to bring in the bill on mandatory minimum sentencing for drug crimes as a bill that's going to be tough on organized crime and the big traffickers. We heard the Minister of Justice say that again today, as he had so many times. But the reality is, is that mandatory minimums do not deter organized crime. Instead, they almost exclusively affect small dealers, street-level traffickers, and nonviolent offenders, while leaving the door wide open for organized crime to step in and fill the void created by the sweeps at the lower end. Even the Justice Department, the Canadian Justice Department, in its report of 2002, concluded that mandatory minimum sentences are the least effective in relation to drug offences. And I have to say that the Minister of Justice has never been able to offer a shred of evidence that mandatory minimums uh, are a deterrence, that they work. He was grilled on this in committee the last time the bill went through the House. This is now the third time we've had this bill. He could not offer any evidence that mandatory minimums are effective, uh, that they will 
deal with our complex drug issues. Uh, whereas all the evidence, Mr. Speaker, is to the contrary, um, that this bill will have many harmful effects, including increasing the prison population, uh, 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 changing Canada's drug strategy from a four-pillar approach that includes enforcement, but also includes things like prevention and treatment and harm reduction. We know that the Conservatives changed that strategy in 2007 because, again, they're totally focused on, on the proposition that somehow a new bill, a new offence, a stiffer penalty, a mandatory minimum is going to deal with some of these complex issues. Mr. Speaker, the evidence out there from experts, I mean, I've got a letter here that's got three pages of organizations uh, and uh, individual experts who have all studied um, this legislation, particularly as it applies to uh, mandatory minimums, and who all come to the same conclusion that there is no evidence that this, that this legislation is warranted and that it will actually um, uh, assist our society overall. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'd also point out, again, more evidence that uh, um, even the Auditor General, when she audited um, uh, drug enforcement um, uh, a few years ago, uh, when we had a special committee on the non-medical use of drugs, she produced a very sig significant report um, that called for an increased emphasis on prevention, treatment and rehabilitation. And what became clear is that even at that time, something like 73% 70, of federal funds were being spent on enforcement, 14% on treatment, 7% on research, 2.6% on prevention, and 2.6% on harm reduction. So even the Auditor General, from a, a very neutral, independent standpoint, came to the conclusion that the so-called drug strategy um, was, a, was not working, it was not effective, and could not sh be shown to be um, transparent or actually um, assisting in terms of uh, drug issues in local communities. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I have to say that, that uh, this bill in particular, the drug bill that uh, they tried to get through the Senate, they tried to get through the House, um, is taking Canada in a completely wrong direction. It's a direction that is very expensive, it, ha it will have no effect on drug use itself, and it will only increase the prison population, creating a new set of overpopulation that with it will come health and safety concerns and problems that then manifest themselves within the prison system. And anybody who doesn't understand that, as I said at the beginning, is simply fooling themselves and is blind to the reality and the evidence that is now before us. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Conservative government changed the drug strategy in 2007, and as a result, we've now been down this path similar to the U.S. experience, when everything that is telling us from the U.S. that they actually began to understand, even the most right-wing conservatives, um, as quoted by my colleague, um, even the most right-wing conservatives in the U.S. have begun to recognize the massive failure of the course that they undertook of incarcerating people, of using an enforcement, relying on an enforcement approach in mandatory minimums. Surely we have lessons to learn from this in Canada. So, Mr. Speaker, um, I want to say loud and clear, and I'm very glad that all my colleagues are speaking out on this bill. Uh, we feel that this bill is offensive in the way it's been brought together, of putting together nine uh, significant bills that need to be dealt with individually, and uh, many of the provisions of this bill, but in particular the, the drug bill, um, is a bill that has no evidence that it will work. In fact, on the contrary, it has all of the evidence that it will be harmful, it will be costly, and it's the wrong direction for this country to take. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In some comments, <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Winnipeg South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my first opportunity to rise in this debate, and I did listen to the, the member from Vancouver Centre's uh, presentation on this and some of her ideas. She did speak to drug crime and her concerns with uh, the legislation as such. In Winnipeg, uh, of course, we, we also have drug crime. We, we do have abuse of, of certain narcotics, uh, heroin, for instance. And in light of the fact that she uh, doesn't think that legislation within this place is the right approach, I'm wondering if she would recommend to the citizens of Winnipeg for us to perhaps uh, 
create uh, an insight facility in downtown Winnipeg and perhaps if she could give some comment on that. Member for Vancouver East. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, I can only say that um, to me um, it's up to the people of Winnipeg to determine what they see as the solutions to the very difficult questions that they're favoring, that they're facing in their community. I know in, in Vancouver East, when we were dealing with uh, very difficult uh, uh, drug overdoses, it was from the local community, including the police, including the Board of Trade, including businesses, including uh, uh, the health uh, professionals, um, that, that it was uh, determined that a safe facility for people to go was the way to, was, was actually part of the solution. Um, no one has ever suggested that be imposed anywhere else. That's up to the residents of his community to determine what those solutions are. Things that are grown locally and come from the local experience are the things that work the best. Comments, the Honourable Member for Vancouver Centre. Speaker, I, I want to congratulate the Honourable Member for an excellent presentation and I wanted to ask her a particular question. There are nine different areas dealt with in this legislation, but nowhere does this legislation have anything to say about those with mental illness who are in prisons. And we actually know that up to 20% of youth in, men, in prisons today have a mental illness, up to 29% of women in prisons today have a mental illness, and 50% of Canadian offenders report substance abuse as a cause for their offense. Existing information tells us that all, all mostly people who enter prisons, especially those with mental illness, show extreme depression and hopelessness before they go into prison. So does the member have a comment on this fact that what we are actually doing is warehousing the mentally ill in prisons today? This is going to increase with this kind of legislation, yet there is nothing to be done to deal with this medical problem and to find an appropriate way for dealing with it in prisons. Member for Vancouver East. Uh, well, I'd like to thank the member from Vancouver Centre for her observations, which I believe are entirely correct. And I think that there's a, an attitude from the government that, uh, that if you make people invisible, if you stuff them into overcrowded facilities, um, that somehow invisibility means that you've dealt with the problem. And of course, nothing could be further from the truth. There are many reports, many alarming reports that show us that the situation and conditions in terms of safety and health uh, and lack of, of rehabilitation in our pr prison system is something that has a cumulative effect. And so when, we, when these bills are passed and we just blindly increase the, the prison population without knowing the impacts, we are actually creating a worse problem than we had in the beginning. Comments? Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Brandt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to ask this member a question based on a real experience this past weekend when I participated in a walk of um, the citizens in my riding against drunk driving. And in one case, I met with two families who had lost their two sons tragically just over a year ago uh, with a drunk driver having run into them, and it was a youth offender, and um, these people were advocating for stiffer penalties for such a crime, the death of their 16 and 17 year old ch children. Secondly, I met with a, a mother of a, of a son who had been uh, brutally beaten uh, to the point of being now uh, being severely disabled, uh, mentally disabled. And this lady came up to me and thanked me for this crime bill. She said, it's time that the people who perpetrated this on her son, who now has lifetime disabilities, will never work, will, will never function properly, and yet got off scot-free from doing that, what her reaction is to those kinds of victims in this country. Honourable Member for Vancouver East, a short response, please. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think we all have great sympathy for people who have gone through that experience. But one of the problems with this debate that comes from the Conservatives is the implication that somehow there aren't any laws that exist, that somehow we're, we're creating laws, and without this, there's mayhem. The fact is we already have very, uh, we have a very tough criminal code. We have, a, we have a judicial system that allows discretion for judges to take into account individual situations. And one of the problems with these bills is that they remove that discretion. So in actual fact, we're making the system less responsive and less uh, effective. 
resuming debate. The